Thank you for tuning in today to Coming Home. My name is Charles Doherty, and I want to talk to you. My journey coming to Christ was in 1984, and the early part of that was uh, just challenge. In this friend. world, you will have trouble. But then he goes on to say, don't be afraid or fear not, because I've overcome the world. I've beaten the things you're facing. Welcome to Coming Home. My, my name is Charles Doherty. I'm often called Brother Charles because that last name is a little hard to say and remember. And we have as our amazing guest today, wonderful guest, Steve Russell. Steve is the Executive Director of Faith Outreach Ministries. I want to read to you it's, uh, the mission. The mission of Faith Outreach Ministries is to take the message of Jesus Christ to whomever and wherever the Lord sends us, referring to you and your wife and people on the team, God's word to Paul in Acts 26, 18 fits us to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may have receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus Christ. So, whomever and wherever that's right. That's being yielded. That's right. How did you learn to be yielded like that? I think uh, growing up in Sioux City, Iowa, going to church, but not being a Christian, but going to church, living in an alcoholic home and having to be flexible with things that would take place. And uh, my mom was a, was a great uh, pattern for flexibility in doing what needed to be done and never allowing us kids, there's two of us, to be victims in the situation that we lived in. So you said to me earlier, uh, as we were talking, growing up in the alcoholic home, there was an empty feeling. Can you describe what that felt like? There was something missing in my life. Um, I watched other kids when, when I would go to uh, high school particularly this were my teen years is when my dad was drinking more and working more and and he was we call it he was of our home but not in the home mm. and uh, and so there was an emptiness and I'd luckily I could see a good family in one of my best friends in high school I'd go over there a lot and his dad kind of filled in he was a military man and I'd walk in and he'd smack me in the back and say straighten up and I loved it Huh? Absolutely loved it. Okay, now folks, we're going to be on a journey today <laughs> with uh, our friend Steve. He's your new friend also. And we're on a journey because where we started out to where you are today. You've had a variety of experiences. We're going to look at those a little briefly here. A variety of experiences that have led you to where you are. And per this mission to whomever and wherever the Lord sends us, you're actually really open right now. And um, in these years of your life, I didn't say later, you <laughs> noticed that. We're both middle-aged. <laughs> you're still open to God changing direction and putting you in new places. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about how eventually Steve's story, God's story through Steve, brings him to the place where today... Uh, you're two, week, two days a week in prison ministries, in the prison, uh, 10 hours or so a day. Mm -hmm. It seems to me when I listen to you, maybe yeah. 12 sometimes, 12, yeah. 12, 12, yeah. 12, yeah. Uh, two days, you're there and you're loving it. So we're going to look at the story of this man. He also is pastoring, he's in congregations, he's counseling people, he's meeting one-on-one. -on -one. He's, uh, but he's in that prison, uh, and that's our focus today. Okay. We're going to look at different aspects that make up who Steve Russell is and who, uh, how God has shaped his life from that beginning. You know, we all need somebody that's going to slap us on the back and say, straighten up. Yeah. And we're going to see how mm -hmm. the absence of that in a person in Steve's life caused uh, that person didn't have that influence and actually in ministry, in Christian ministry, wound up in prison and um, Steve goes to visit him and here we are two days a week, 12 hours a day. Yeah. And so folks, let me tell you, God does not waste anything 
in your life and mine. Mm -hmm. It doesn't waste anything. And it all becomes, can become, part of our story. When, before we even get into the story, can you recall, now this is all live, folks. It's not rehearsed. Yeah. So <laughs> can you recall a point where you said, oh, you kind of had this revelation that, uh, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but just uh, where everything in your life kind of came into focus to where you are today? Yes, I believe I can share that. that. Was that a big aha moment or was it just a sober moment? Or what? I think because of the past building up into that, okay, it was, it was a, a lot along the way, but then when I gave my life to Christ, there was, there was a dramatic change, you know? And the, the, and I would just say this, that if you were raised in an alcoholic home and you're, it was your dad or your mom, I just thank God that my mom did not go down that road and that she did say, you're not gonna be victims, you're gonna be victorious in, through this thing and we're not to feel sorry for ourselves. And that is a big, big thing in my life. And you know, my mom set a tone for all of this. There were times when I was a teenager and, and Saturday mornings, and particularly early teens, like 12, 13, preteen, to th she'd, she'd wake me up, she said, uh, get up, we're going to help so-and-so clean out her garage. It was an elderly woman or elderly women. We'd go clean out their garage and, and put stuff. And she said, it was back then when you could take the papers, stacks and stacks and boxes of papers, and take them down to a place and have them weighed, and I could make some money. And I didn't have a job, so I was just doing that. And so she would just, in all of these little projects, helping people just begin to keep me, uh, it, it didn't fully trust me because when you have a natural self, you're selfish, you're self-centered. But it was a planting of the seed. And uh, I think there's a scripture that says, raise up, a ch train up a child in the way they should go their own unique way, and when they're old, they will not depart from it. Mm -hmm. So I remember those days where you could take paper and get uh -huh. it weighed. Yeah. I don't know, three cents a pound. I mean, it was something, but it was, yeah. Yeah. those days, three cents was a lot of money. <laughs> That's right. So, and we're just middle-aged, remember that. <laughs> so, um, so, folks, here today, we're talking about prison ministry, but this program is going to be relevant if you have a, f a spouse or a child or a friend, you know, sibling that's an alcoholic. And this is going to be helpful for, for you yes. if you have somebody in your small group, in the congregation you know, in the workplace. Uh, there's great compassion so you're, that can come out of this program. So your mother set a, pre pro, uh, a precedent, an example for you mm -hmm. of helping other people. <laughs> and um, there are three pillars that Faith Outreach Ministry is based on, and the first one is the Ministry of Helps. Did you ever associate that with your mom before? No, no. So here we are. See, God, uh, that, that's a revelation right uh -huh. on the spot. Yep. So uh, we all know we can look back and still learn more about the past. So now, how, uh, high school, I mean, you played football. No. I, I heard you telling one, somebody. One, one year, and, one year. I, and it was the third third team fullback and that's called the tackling dummy. But I always said I helped a guy become honorable mention all state fullback just with that one year of training him how to hit people. And I was the, I was the one that was getting hit. So, so uh, swimming? Were you, I was on a very good swim team. Uh, my junior year in Sioux City Central, we had seven high school All-Americans. I was not one of them. I was on junior varsity. But here's the thing about that swimming team that really helped me. Our coach treated everybody on that team as if we were all Americans. He pushed us and pushed us and pushed us and tried to get us into some competition outside because if you're junior varsity, you got a little bit of competition, but he wanted us swimming wherever we could. That is amazing. So now you've just told me in the matter of four minutes about a second person basically slapping you on the back. Yeah. You're an All-American, you can do this, become the best you can be. Yeah, even though I was far from an All-American, <laughs> far from it. But yeah. he treated you with respect, yes. integrity, mm -hmm. and uh, you responded. Yeah. 
And I'm, there's a soft place in my heart for him ever since. You know, folks, this would be a good time to start. It's, uh, th this program is going to air somewhere around Christmas, but it's good any time that it airs for you to start a list of people that have impacted your life in a positive way and send them a thank you note or make a phone call or take them out to dinner, whatever. This is a perfect time to start thinking about these people because we've heard two right now. I will say- Three, I will, your I mother. Will, yes. Go help it. I will, inter I will intersect with the, impressing upon people what you just said. Okay. Is that when I, got, when I came to Jesus Christ, I was 34 and a half, that I wrote four of my best friends. Two were Christians and the others weren't. But I wrote them and I thanked them for, for their impact in my life, keeping me straight during high school. Amazing. You know, if this is all we did on this program, this would be yeah. enough. So the rest of this is all, it's all dessert, folks. It's, all, it's just going to get better from here. So I know you went to Iowa State, the paper uh, on the website. There is a page that you can see about Faith Outreach Ministries. It says you went to Iowa State. What influenced you to go to Iowa State? How did you wind up there? <laughs> Originally, I was trying to go there. I was going there to please my dad. You know, there's one thing that you always want to do is, it, particularly if he's not involved, but even if he was involved, you want to please him. And so he was a mechanical engineer, very brilliant guy mm. and, and very hardworking guy. And I wanted to go there, but you know what? Um, you can be thankful that I never became a civil engineer <laughs> because I don't know that their elevator is big enough to catch the traffic that comes here and has to stop because the highway's down here. Uh, if you get the okay. picture, okay. But anyway, it wasn't your area, <clears throat> and that's when I just went on a search and took a took a social took the beginning <clears throat> sociology class, which most people, uh, if you know this signal, you know, really was not their favorite. You know, like they could do without it. But I took a, a, a second sociology class. I liked the first one, but the second one was taught, uh, <clears throat> taught by a Jewish, Orthodox Jewish man out of New York. And <clears throat> I remember one, one class, he got to talking about the Holocaust and tears and just the, you know, anxiety, you know, the, not the anxiety, just the agony, agony. Of, of, of losing relatives. And man, that just hit me. There was, there was not just intellectual information, there was passion about what he believed. And our books were all not a textbook. They were like, like one of the books that influenced me was Black Like Me. It was a white gentleman in the South who, who put on some kind of skin coloring and, and rode the buses of the South and had to sit in the back. And he experienced, you know, uh, the uh, oppressiveness of seg segregation. And it was one of the books that just impacted my life. So that class was called Social Problems. Mm -hmm. So you looked at different social problems. And so did that hook you on helping people, trying to do something about these? Right. And then I took some classes on social work, you know, that was part okay. of the sociology department at Iowa State at that time. And, and uh, yeah, it... Uh, and what was neat is uh, in one of the classes, uh, a, f a football player, African-American football player and I were assigned, we worked at Beloit of Ames together. And so Eli and I got to be friends and he started sharing some of the uh, difficulties being black at Iowa State at a time when there weren't a lot of black football players. And, uh, and it, was, um, it was just heart wrenching and yet he shared his heart with me and man, that, that just really touched me. So you worked together, you worked through college? Well, we had a, we had a I think, I don't know if it was three months uh, segment where we were going over to the Beloit Children's Home in Ames, Iowa and working with uh, uh, emotionally disturbed kids together. Okay. In kind of a recreation, physical fitness thing. So you graduate Iowa State, somewhere in there, you met somebody too. Yes, yes. I actually went to the University of Nebraska for a semester, got out and worked because I was going to go to social work. Their football team did so well. The, it's, it's, uh, there's blessings in poverty. I could not afford to stay there because the out-of-state tuition went up beyond my level of being okay. able to afford to go. And I went back and it was the second year back, my last year, 
that I met my wife, Jeannie. Uh, and you're a wonderful couple, a great couple. If you just tuned in, we are doing an interview with Steve Russell. He's the executive director of Faith Outreach Ministries. We are going to be talking about prison ministries, but we're learning about the story that takes us there and the passion of this man. You go from Iowa State to Iowa for graduate school. You work there with uh, uh, some mentally challenged which is uh, individuals, which is part of your classwork. Yeah. Yep. And uh, any significant things you learned there or impact there for your passion? I, I think I met a teacher in grad school. She was coming back for her master's degree and she'd been, uh, her name was Hazel Turk. What a gem. And she, she uh, we were involved in a class, several of us together and on a project wrote, writing some things. And this woman was so passionate about at the time, we, the, the label was mentally retarded, you know, mental retardation. But we have other things for that now. But, yeah. but she was so passionate about what, and, and I just loved being around her. She was probably in her 50s and uh, pretty young from this standpoint right now. But, but she was passionate about what she did. And I wanted to be passionate about whatever I did. So we've just heard another person yeah. Folks, don't, I, I hope you're thinking as we're talking about people that were passionate in your life. You go from Iowa State, you go up to Independence, to the Mental Health Institute. Institute. And uh, you meet a gentleman there, Bill Hood. Yes. And uh, so he's had some influence on your life also. Yes. So uh, any lessons you want to share that you learned while you were at Independence at the Mental Health Institute? Well, I was working with uh, 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 not, not uh, mentally ill kids, but pre, they, a new program called Pre-Delinquent Adolescents, working with a great psychologist and a social worker. But Bill was a, was a social worker on another service, and he and I began to have some time together, uh, and this was my... Uh, uh, this was towards the end of the time I was going to be at the Mental Health Institute, didn't know that. But, but just the counsel, just the way he cared about people. Here's an African-American social worker in a predominantly uh, Caucasian environment. And he was so well received and known among patients who might return and families that might be you known. And people that I talked to out in the community when we lived Oh, you know, do you know Bill Hood? I said, Bill, yeah, I know who he is. Yeah. Oh, he's a wonderful man. Passionate, I'm sure. Yes. So here we go. What are you passionate about, folks? Yeah. God's designed us yes. in such a way that we would find that niche where we would be passionate about what he has us doing because God's very passionate. Mm -hmm. So Bill moves on in uh, his life, mm -hmm. goes to Cedar Rapids, to the Jane Boyd Community House. house. And um, then you get a phone call and, and uh, come check out Jane Boyd in Cedar Rapids. And we Cedar Rapidians are glad you answered that call and went down to Jane Boyd. Uh, and so again, here you are. Uh, you're at Jane Boyd, you're helping people. And um, now, though, you meet a pastor who's mm -hmm. passionate. Yes, yes. And a good friend of both of ours. Yes. Uh, he had influence on uh, my life as well. And so uh, you meet him. And do we want to say his name on the air? Sure. Name's Pastor Larry Johnson. Larry Johnson. He's still my pastor. Yeah, still friends these years. And uh, we're going to have Larry watch this. But he's a passionate man. Yes. And you meet him, you're touched by that passion. And then uh, sometime later, you see him in the newspaper mm -hmm. opening up the Open Door Counseling Ministry. Yeah. Ministry. Open Door Counseling Ministry. So. Now, we need to have our eyes open, uh, not to coincidences, incidences, but God incidences, yes. because you, uh, tell us what happened. You see that article in the newspaper, and you're thinking to yourself, well, 
I just saw it and I thought, what a unique thing. You step away from the security of a, of a big church as the associate pastor and you move, move into this little block house with another guy and you're counseling and trusting God for your, for your income. So, so what you just said was, he was at he was at associate a, at a large in a large congregation, mm -hmm. and financially and he leaves that and goes over to this very small building, <laughs> smaller than a garage for a car can go in. Uh -huh. Building still there, I think, on Mount mm -hmm. Vernon Road. And uh, so you continue with your story. Well, then then uh, a couple things transpose where I wasn't uh, around him at all. And then I started working at Mercy Hospital in 1976 with the uh, Sedlicek Treatment Center, Alcohol Treatment Center, as a physical fitness recreation guy. And I started to go through some stuff. And uh, Now let me just okay, interrupt yeah. you one oh. second. Sedlicek Treatment Center is for who? For alcohol and drug abusers. Alcohol and drug abusers, and we remember that you grew up in a yeah. home with an alcoholic dad. So continue. And, and anyway, uh, I was working there, and, and uh, I, I said to myself one day, because I have a wonderful wife, two wonderful little kids at that time, and she's still my wonderful wife after 48 years. And, and the kids are still wonderful. They're just they not kids, little they're anymore. Just, they're just not little. I was gonna, okay. <laughs> and seven wonderful grandkids. But anyway, I um, uh, lost my train of thought momentarily. Um, I said to, I kind of said this to myself. I loved working at Sedlicek Treatment Center. My boss was a, uh, uh, one of the nuns, just a precious lady, Sister Judith Myers. And anyway, I said to myself, I really have it made. I've got the best job I could ever ask for. A wonderful wife, kids. I'm in a, t a city that we love. And this was in 1977, actually, mm -hmm. in the spring of 77. And from that moment on, I could begin to trace it. I started to, to get, I was an, I call myself an optimistic survivor. Okay, you survive an alcoholic home. Yeah, there's wounds and stuff and we don't have to go into that. But, but, uh, but I was, uh, I started to become empty. And one day I said to myself, but it was God reminding me, I need to see Larry Johnson at that place that he and Eddie, I wonder if they're still involved in that. And as I was thinking, the day I was thinking about it, I'd taken some time off because I was just exhausted. I was exasperated by just the struggle. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so Nikki was very young and I put her on the back of the bike and was going to take her up to the, to the top of Arizona Avenue and turn on Lawrence towards the school. And, and I get up the top and all of a sudden I see this guy coming on a motorcycle and it's Larry Johnson. And he has just dropped his daughter off at one of her high school friends that lives up on Arizona court. <clears throat> and so I waved him down and I said, Larry, how you doing? We started talking. I said, Larry, I just need to come and talk to you. And he said, okay, why don't you give me a call? So I did. And I went in to see him at, at that little block house. And, and uh, he talked to me about Jesus, talked to me about some of his things, but I wasn't ready. I said, well, I think I'm okay. I'm okay. You know, so you can be very much deceived when you're, you're saying you're okay and you're not. But that was the beginning of a relationship where we would run into each other while I was working at Mercy Hospital. I'd run into him at least once a week when I'd go for coffee and he'd be in there having coffee and, and we'd just say hi or talk. And, and anyway, that led to the man who eventually led me to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amazing. It's almost 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yes. So now you're different on the inside. Mm -hmm. And we know that the scripture says, if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things are passed away. Everything becomes new. Mm -hmm. So now you're looking at everything new. So what happens next then? Well, I was looking at everything new, but I was looking at God, and God wasn't bringing these things to condemn me. He says very clearly in John 3, 18, you know, where he doesn't come to condemn us, but if we don't believe. But I was just in the early stages of the infancy. Mm -hmm. And I began to remember all of these things that I had done wrong, all of these things where I had betrayed people or things that I had uh, 
done, had done, you know, like a couple of fights when I was involved in, you know, younger years and, and uh, uh, you know, I don't need to go into that. But anyway, I use a couple of those as an analogy about how Satan can really beat you up. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, going through all those things and just saying, Lord, I'm sorry. And, and it wasn't out of condemnation. It was out of him showing me in those past situations how much he loves me. And it was so important. And one of the things that happened out of our relation, coming to this relationship with Christ was the farthest thing from my mind. I woke up about 30 days after I came to Christ and I had something going on on the inside of me. And I had to call Larry. And I said, Larry, I gotta, we got to talk. And so we got together. I said, okay, what's a calling? And he just kind of <laughs> smiled at me. And he said, well, that's where God's calling you to do something, you know? And, and I said, hey, man, I didn't sign up for the ministry in this thing. And let me give you just a brief two or three sentence history of me. I had a cousin recently when I was telling her that I was been going to the jail. She said that me and my cousin Dick Johnson were the most ornery, worst kids ever to come through our church. <laughs> and so... I, I thought, in fact, if they had lined us all up and said, let's see, who's going to be in the ministry? Steve, go ahead and have a seat. But here he was calling me, and, and I had always wanted to be a counselor, but my master's wasn't in counseling. But every place I went, God opened the doors to just talk to people. This was before Christ. Mm -hmm. And at the Selichek Treatment Center, one time the director came to me and said, Steve, I want you to join one of our counselors uh, at the, one of the aftercare. I want you to be a co-counselee uh, with an aftercare group because you listen well. And I want you in that. Well, see, I, you know, you don't recognize those things. And so, but anyway, uh, this calling came, and, and so Larry didn't tell me that God had spoken to his heart in November of 77 that I would be his next partner. And his wife just went, are you kidding me? He's not even saved yet. And Larry said he must be on his way, something like that. I don't know what there he said. There we go. So Recognized that. ahead of time. Yeah. Recognized by the director in the Sedlicek Center. Recognized, one who listens. You know, that's so important. Folks, uh, we all are designed by God to have a passion. We're all designed by God for unique work in the kingdom. It doesn't mean you quit your job wherever you're working, uh, in a manufacturing mm -hmm. plant, in That's a retail right. store, in the school system, in the government office. It doesn't mean you quit that nece necessarily. Some do, but most, the majority of people in the setting, God's doing something in you that he's gonna use right there because how else are those people going to see real life example of the kingdom of God? So the calling of God was evident even before you submitted your life to Christ. Right. Uh, so what you just said a moment ago too, now there's the director of the Sedlicek Center that's instrumental mm -hmm. in your life because she has you doing he, something, yeah, he, yeah, or he, he, yeah. he has you doing something that you're going to be doing later on in the kingdom. Yeah. Folks, it's a th constant theme throughout uh, the time we've had just so far, and we're not even halfway through, and that is passion, calling, people in your life that have helped you along the way. Uh, we all need somebody to slap us on the back and say, straighten up. So, so here we are. So I want to move on to the next thing here. <laughs> this, is, this is really good. So uh, he had seen you're going to be his next partner in the counseling ministry because the one he had had moved on mm -hmm. out of state etc right. so now he needs two even though that building's small he needs two because there's a lot of people that are hurting folks and they need someone who's going to listen to them and uh, talk to them so now how, what happened then between your meeting with larry and then you leaving a uh, human services area and coming over here into the spiritual human services area at Open Door Counseling Ministries. 
the biggest thing was this. Larry met with me every week, and, and he said, if you have a phone, if you need to call me, you call me, which I did that time about the calling. And we, we met continually, and he began to expose me to the scriptures and other things and, and make some recommendations for some studying and took me to some meetings and, and, uh, and uh, studied about the Holy Spirit and just, just had a unique uh, experience with the Holy Spirit and just knew that this was really what God wanted me to do. And, and it was interesting that God orchestrated without those two talking together, Larry Johnson and Sister Judith Myers. And I talked to Sister Judith Myers and I was gonna, I was gonna resign in March of that year. And she said, Steve, we're not ready. We're not ready for you to resign. Can you give us a month or so? And then in talking to Larry at some point in time, it came up, he said, Steve, I think what we ought to do is have you start May 1st. And God just took care of all of that. And as I looked back, I thought, whoa, he is well able to take care of us and put things together. I'm thinking of several scriptures here. Man mm. makes his plans, but God directs That's his several. footsteps. You know, and just the timing of things and letting God lead us and mm. cry out for wisdom. He who lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to everyone with great liberality. You know, he'll give us more than we need. So, Can I, can I share with you about the first day of the counseling ministry? I wish could, you would. <laughs> Your first day. Let's, first let's hear day. It. Because of the experiences that I had with different people and, and my mom and all of the impact of the people that, that you know, we've talked about now, that there was only one group of people that I was very uncomfortable with and intimidated by. Wealthy people. Okay? So the first day of the counseling ministry, I go in there and, and I'm praying and reading the Word because Larry said, if nobody comes in, you just pray and read the Word. And so that's what I was doing. And in that first session in the morning with God, he spoke to me and he said, and it's the first time I heard him say, son. Pay attention then, now, don't you? Well, two things. Number one, and I'm not going to try to get emotional here, that I realized I had a father. Oh, nice. Very nice. And he said, son, remember this and never forget it. I'm the counselor. The word is the counsel, and you're the conduit, and don't ever mix those up. Can you say that one more time, please? He said, I am, meaning I, the great I am. Yes. I am the counselor. The word is the counsel, and you are the conduit, and never get those confused. So anyway, I go to lunch, and I come back, and I walk into the ministry. We had a wonderful lady who was our volunteer secretary, and I heard her say as I walked through the door, she said, Larry is not here, but here comes Steve. You can talk to him. And, I, and, and this gentleman turned around, and I immediately recognized him. But I said, hi, I'm Steve Russell, and he was a very well-to-do businessman whose name Yep, we don't, that's not the important thing. But I recognized him. And I said, can I help you? And he said, my life's a mess. Can you help? And I said, my office is right down this short hallway. <laughs> and as he turned to go, I said, Lord, I thank you that your word says that you've not given me a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, 2 Timothy 1, 7. And Lord, I thank you that I will not be afraid. And the reason for this and, and you can <clears throat> examine maybe in your own life where a fear comes up, maybe for a particular population. But in 1957, my dad bought a $50,000 home in a very wealthy neighborhood and said it was for my mom. But it was, might have been for mom, but it was also a well-stocked bar all the time. And, but it was in a wealthy neighborhood. And I didn't relate to the kids. The kids were you know, one guy was a really good athlete and the other guy was, I mean, they were both great students. I was like a fish out of water. And so I was intimidated, you know, and I always wanted to go back to the old neighborhood and be around, hang around the guys that knew me since I was little and, I mean, sure. you know, in a comfortable place. But God sometimes will put us in a place that we think is going to be comfortable. I was really looking forward to counseling. 
but then when he said he's the counselor, that really zeroed me in and I, and I, I grasped that. But this first guy, and so I went and we sat down and I just said, well, tell me what's going on. And he just laid out his heart. And see, this is where you don't even know you're prepared to get into the situation. Doesn't mean we're, that Larry wasn't preparing me. But I started sharing things. And even from my confirmation class that I took at our church, some scriptures popped up. God just brought them to me. We had to memorize scriptures, but they never got down in my heart, by the way. They were all in my head, just an intellectual thing of sorts. But anyway, uh, that, that uh, the scriptures just flowed, the, the conversation just flowed, and, and we interacted more, inter the interaction. And then I finally said to him, sir, you, need, you really need Jesus in your life. He's going to be the only one that can pull this mess together that's been created. And we knelt on the floor of the office and he gave his life to Christ. And we sat up and, and I was 35. And I didn't look quite 35 then. You know, I was a little, looking a little younger then. And he said, uh, he said to me, finally we talked a little bit, he said, you know what? You don't look old enough to just do what you did, but you're really good at this. How long have you been doing this? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, about an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> and he just broke down and cried. And guess what? You know, the counselor is supposed to keep it together. Yeah. I lost it. Oh, yeah. So we're sitting in that room crying together. Your first one. Now, listen, listen, everybody. Uh, I, I want to highlight a couple of things you said. First off, you turned to go down the hallway and you quoted scripture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then a verse from confirmation class came up. Now, John 14, 26 tells us that the Holy Spirit will bring to our remembrance what we need in the day we need it. But he'll bring it. We've got to put it there. We've got to be exposed to it. Mm -hmm. We need to memorize it. Even when you didn't know what it meant and it was just up here as information uh, what i call is it was being put in your resource library yes exactly so exactly. we need to read the word whether we understand it or not we're putting it in our resource library so that is key to everything right there uh, so the holy spirit can bring it out we need to move uh, you know we were wondering before like we have enough information, yep. but now we're having to kind of hurry to get where we're going. Okay. So here you are, uh, you're at Open Door Counseling Ministries. You hear of a friend of yours in another town who is doing well in ministry, but because he got in a situation where there was nobody slapping him on the back saying, straighten up, he falls into difficulties and he winds up in jail. And he winds up in Muscatine. Mm -hmm. in the county jail. So you, because he's a friend, you go see him. Yes. And as I understand our conversation, uh, they haven't let you leave since. <laughs> uh, that, that one visit, what happened there in that going to visit him that has now moved you to two days a week in that same prison? What happened, Steve? I saw a friend who had actually, he had served time before and was a volunteer with us in Des Moines with Youth for Christ when I was traveling there. And I, I had to meet with him for a year because of his record and the seriousness of his record. But we began to talk and we began to just get close. And, and then he started a, an outreach with another guy that had been in, in uh, state prison with him. And they just did a marvelous work with tough kids. They could relate to him, they could talk to him. And, uh, and so then, but then he, he started an outreach thing in Des Moines for guys getting out of prison. And, and he had me come over and talk one night and I was just in awe. And I want to tell you something, that there are so many guys in prison and jail who have such a strong destiny with God. Yes. The stuff that they have learned that they've used wrongly, God flips it by the power of the Holy Spirit and the Word in them to do great things. And I saw in this man a great entrepreneur. A great, he, 
he rallied the resources and he put this thing together and got other people and this thing was functioning. And I sat in on a couple small groups uh, where guys were, were helping each other. It was just miraculous. And so when he slipped back, uh, I had to go see him. We were almost family by that time. Sure. And so I went and, and talked to him. It was, a, it was both heartbreaking to see him once again in prison or in jail at this time and seeing him. But we began to talk and we began to just go back to the word together. And, and there was a lot of, he was doing a lot of repenting of things. And, and he just really got back on track and started. We helped him start a Bible course that really made a difference in his life. Well, I would come and visit him about maybe every other Thursday for about an hour and a half through the glass. Well, then the next time I came, he said, well, there's a couple other guys that want to see you. And so I said, well, are the officers okay with it? And he said, yeah, they're, all, they're fine with it. So after he got done, and then another guy came, and he got done, and then they brought another guy. So now I'm seeing three. Within a couple of weeks, I'm seeing a full day of these guys. They just want to talk to somebody mm -hmm. who will encourage them, uh, see uh, the gift of God in them. And, and so, and pretty soon he filled the whole schedule. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now I was starting to come every week. And, and then I got, the chaplain got a hold of me uh, one time I was coming out for lunch break. And, and he said, in essence, uh, I want you eventually to come in. And then he made that happen. So now uh, you're in there now two days a week. Mm -hmm. I know you're so very faithful at this. And you've got some people that you're training. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're in there even when you're not. Is that correct? Here, yes. Here's, well, here's, here's what happened. There's a, there's a ministry that was formed, Just In Time Ministries. Mm -hmm. and, and they were beginning to do some things. But in the meantime, Billy and Brooke, who both have a past in, in jail and in prison, Billy particularly, they'd been coming in. And they'd been seeing people through the monitors. And a monitor is simply uh, kind of a TV thing on this side and a TV thing that runs into the uh, pod. And you ask for somebody and then the, you know, whoever's controlling the things turns them on and you've got 20 minutes to talk to somebody. And Billy had been very faithful to do that for several years, okay? And so then I talked to the captain and I said, you know, this, is, this guy is really, really good, and he talks right straight up to these guys because he's been there. And so Billy's been coming in, and he does, the Sunday, uh, he does the Thursday night church service, and he comes in and sees guys and does some Bible studies in the evening. His, his wife, Brooke, does the women with some friends uh, that they've put together. And so Just In Time Ministries is a local ministry out of Muscatine, and there's another young man, Tim, who has been faithful. And, uh, okay, and anyway, but anyway, they, they, they serve God by going in and doing face-to-face -face work with those incarcerated. Now, why, um, why is prison, I'm going to give you a few minutes to talk about this, because we're down to our, our last 15 minutes here. Mm -hmm. So I want you to take a few minutes. Why is, uh, d does the scripture tell us about prison ministry? Uh, why is it important that we not forget? Yes. I, and I'll have more questions after that, but some minutes on that. Why is this important? Matthew, not that we already don't see why. Yeah. It's kind of obvious because you're helping one and he brings a second and a third. It's kind of like Andrew going to get Peter. Here's help, you know. Yeah. Uh, here's some answers for us. And I know that some of these men who live on the inside are now also kind of leading some studies, it seems, when mm -hmm. I listen to you. But why is it about Scripture? Let's look at Scripture. Well, Scripture, number one, in Matthew 25, talks about visiting those that are in prison. And, and, and Jesus is saying, if you've done this to the least, you've done it to me. And so, and here's the thing about, for me, the prison is the place, but the least is anybody who's got less than what we have. And I'm not talking about finances, I'm talking about joy and peace, the kind of mm -hmm. things that God gives to us. And so that's one. And then he says, go into all the world. 
Well, my world was first Cedar Rapids and then uh, with YFC there and, you know, and with the open door and with other things. And then the world went to Des Moines. Well, now the world's just gotten a little bit bigger and it's, it's including Muscatine, Iowa and a friend. That, and so, um, you know, and, and here's the thing. Whatever ministry God leads us to is the most important ministry for each one of us. You know, there was a time in my life when I compared myself to some other people in ministry. And, uh, and it just, I had to come to the place where, wait a minute, God, it's such an awesome responsibility and so wonderful. You just call me where you want me to be. I think that goes back up here to uh, take the message to whomever and wherever the Lord sends yeah. us. So you're being very consistent. Now, one part of your life that we didn't even touch on and you just mentioned it in passing, is that you spent a total of 21 years in Youth for Christ. Right. And um, not only in Eastern Iowa, but in Des Moines. And so youth, for, youth ministry, prison ministry, uh, you're preaching on Sundays. So you, you wear some different hats here. But this prison ministry, uh, you have some future plans for where you'd like to see what you're doing go. Can you share those with us? Can I, can I do one thing of value? I wish you would. <laughs> My dad was killed when I was 18 years old. Uh -huh. And I would have loved it if he had been in prison because we could have started a relationship that we never really had. Uh -huh. And I tell that to the guys. I said, you're not dead. And how many, how many young people and even older people Older people that are involved in activities on the street are killed every day around this nation. I don't have statistics, but you just have to open the newspaper to know that. And so I would have liked my dad to be in prison. So I got a chance to speak into these guys' hearts. You're a dad. You write your son or your daughter. And even if they don't know you, find out where they're living through relatives or friends and get involved in their life. Because I will tell you, that if my dad had done that, he would have saved me some painful things between the time I was 18 and 22. Mm, that's a good word. Uh, just just uh, last night or the night before, watching a program on television, this man who'd been incarcerated in Missouri, in uh, I think a state penitentiary, uh, started a, a, a food chain called Sweetie Pies and the goal to hire people who had been incarcerated because he had been. And mm -hmm. right on the TV, he's, he's giving his a mother a tour of this place where he had been in prison, which is now closed and they've torn buildings down and they just kind of drove in. It had to be set up ahead of time to mm -hmm. allow him to go in different places. But he said, if I hadn't have been in prison, I'd been dead. And so he learned a lot of things uh, he didn't say it was easy being in there. Yeah. <laughs> he said he had to fight for everything, right. sometimes literally. Yes. But um, it's made, it made him who he is today. So uh, when you go in, though, even the future plans, these men are just men. That's right. They made some wrong choices, but they're still men. Psalm 139, they were created by God in their mother's womb, yeah. fearfully and wonderfully crafted. They're in there, they have choices in there to either be bitter or to make the most of it, to learn something. But even some of those that may never get out, they're trying to help other, other residents of that prison, are they not? Right. And so uh, tell us, I know that you go in and you meet one-on-one, -on -one, you do Bible studies, you, I know you take Bibles in, we're gonna to get to how you can help Faith Outreach Ministry uh, at the Muscatine not only there, but with some things you want to do. Uh, you, uh, when guys get out, you write them. If they get transferred to another prison, you write them. I know your schedule because I hear you talk about it. I know that you're training others in how to listen. And, um, and then you, you get correspondence courses for these guys yeah. so that they're studying. They're putting it here in the resource library so the Holy Spirit can bring mm -hmm. it out. And you have watched some of those that you have discipled are discipling others inside and correcting others. 
And so uh, you want to add anything to that? Well, yeah, we show movies. We're a visual society. Right. And let me tell you how we got started with movies. It wasn't my idea. <laughs> I didn't have the equipment. And there was a guy who I've gotten to know. He's, he's kind of out now, but I don't talk to him much. I mean, he, he, he's busy. But anyway, um, but he was sitting back there and he said, Steve, I want to see the Passion of Christ. And I think we ought to show it in here. And I called him by name and I just said, hey, I don't have any equipment. He said, there's some equipment in that conference room. Do you think the jail might let you use that? See, there you go. There's an entrepreneur, right? That's exactly right. And so, and so I, I asked the captain and he worked it all out. And if so-and-so is not using it for training of officers, you can use it. And so there we went and we've been showing a movie in every pod almost every week. Every pod, you just use some jail terminology. Uh, I'm sorry, yes. Okay, so what's a pod? Describe it. A pod would be an open area where all of the cells are around, you know, on two sides of it. Okay. Okay. So it'd be like a cell block, if you want to call it. How many living in that? Uh, in the max pods, there's 36 per, per those, those two max pods. And then uh, I think 32 in the minimum. And then we can go on with a few other pods okay. too. Okay, how many men do you see a week? Uh, two days, yeah. 24 hours. You're packing 24 hours in two days. Uh, probably some kind of contact with 70, 75, maybe. And then the next week it might be 70, 75, but not necessarily the same ones from the week before. Yeah, there could be some. Because I understand different. you've got some rotation here. Yeah. Some you see every. So this is amazing. Now, and the other ones that are helping. And three more the, are yeah. they're seeing people. And I know that you, that people have bowed the knee to Christ in, in jail. I know you've had a lot of baptisms, water baptisms, mm -hmm. and you're in discipleship. It's a community that you're ministering to. Right. And you multiply this number of people across the state of Iowa. This is very significant. Yeah. Now, future plans. We're down to our last six minutes here. Okay, so. future plans is this. My heart has always been with Youth for Christ both places and other places that have worked uh, <clears throat> to build up a team and to give local ownership to that ministry. Okay. That happened with Youth for Christ here, happened with Youth for Christ in Des Moines. Do the grunt work, do whatever God wants done, and then find the people to take it over. In that give, county. In that city, county, whatever it might Wherever. be. And so that's, that's my goal. And that is that, uh, uh, I have some input from one of our guys that's gotten out of uh, federal prison and uh, he's written me the names of pastors and, and the sheriff in a particular county in Iowa. And uh, after the first of the year, I want to contact people and start seeing if we can't build something in that particular county jail. So I know now, folks, I know that this has stirred some passion in some of you, uh, but I've got to slap this man on the back and say, be careful. So there might be a significant number of you that would like to see something happen in your community. And uh, so we have to protect him, but he also has a passion to help you. So just know uh, uh, the, the phone number is on the screen here at different times during this hour. And uh, there's, a, there's a website where you can go read this page. There's, there are items on this page we haven't even got to the three pillars of the Ministry of Faith Outreach Ministries, plural. Um, this whole ministry of helps that you learned in the early stage from your mother, go help people clean out mm -hmm. and straighten up their physical buildings. And now you're helping people straighten out their spiritual uh, and emotional and intellectual uh, buildings, house, because yeah. we're to be uh, temple, houses of the Holy Spirit. So uh, Steve has a heart to help you, but I'm going to be checking in on him to make sure he's not running in too many different directions. It's a big job, but somebody's got to do it. I think Jeannie will probably be good there too. Yes, yes. So if you have a passion in your particular area, what I've suggested to him is that you need to get uh, three, four, five, six people that might have a passion to know about this and uh, we'll set up some meetings where you can come to Cedar Rapids and spend some time because not only are you investing 24 hours in side the walls, but you've got the hour and a half drive down your way from home. 
Plus you have people that you're meeting with Monday and Thursday and Friday. So uh, we really appreciate your passion, Steve. Um, you've got uh, two minutes. Mm. What would you like to end with? What are, uh, what are some lessons that you've learned, some constants, whatever, along the way? that you'd like to share with us. So feel free to look at your notes Okay, here. but if we, if we just take John three sixteen, God so loved the world, that's every human being, and uh, you're loved. So if you're still struggling with some stuff left over from your past, just let Jesus into those areas and seek counsel wherever you can find it in your area. But the second thing is that, that, that just like God values you, he values everybody. And I was driving to the jail probably a couple of months after I was going to see my friend early on in, in 2011. And I was driving by construction sites all along Interstate 80 and everywhere else. And God just said to me, and, and the men and women in jail are in orange. And he said to me, these are not messes. I am in the business of reconstructing and restoring well, that's good. lives. That's good. And so when I look at the guys in orange, uh, I just know that God wants to reconstruct them. And my job is to listen with two ears, talk with one mouth, and, and guide them into the scripture, guide them to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and then don't leave them there. Mm. Don't abandon them. John 14, 18 so significant to me when I first came to Christ. He said, I will never abandon you. I will never leave you an orphan. And when you don't have a dad, there can be some of this orphan stuff working. You don't have to exaggerate that. You just know it's hurt and it's empty, but he fills it. And these guys, most of them, 80%, maybe even 90%, you don't even know who their dad is, let alone having a dad for a time. And so there's neat, neat work to be done. And everybody is of value. And you can see how God loves you even more when you spend time with people who have, quote, messed up their life, but he is ready to fix them. The tremendous value of every human life, helping others, learned early, still doing it. God bless you. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, watch this again. Good nuggets here. God bless you. Mm -hmm.